everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Do Good to Lead Well webinar and podcast series. My name is Craig Dowden. I'm the host of this podcast. Absolutely thrilled to have you here today to join us. For those of you who have returned to engage for the live recording, welcome back. Always great to have you and really looking forward to hearing your questions today. Really excited about digging into this conversation. For those of you who have joined for the first time, a very warm welcome. Given a bit of the backstory about Do Good to Lead Well, this podcast was created uh, before the launch of my first book, Do Good to Lead Well, The Science and Practice of Positive Leadership. And about three years ago, at the start of the pandemic, a lot of questions were around, how are we gonna make it through this? What are we gonna do? How can we navigate the current terrain that we're facing? And I have the extraordinary privilege in my coaching and speaking and consulting practice to talk with top CEOs, senior executives, best-selling authors and TED speakers. And what I wanted to do was open up this conversation to a wider community and obtain their insight, their experience, their passion around how we can engage in positive leadership. And a personal thank you at the start of this episode I'm so grateful to share that now Do Good to Lead Well, because of your ongoing support and feedback, is rated in the top 2% of podcasts globally. So that could have never happened without uh, your support. So thank you so, so very much. And I am absolutely thrilled. Like on so many levels, this is for me a, a delight for not just to speak with Anil, also just uh, because of the role, he's Canada's chief statistician and a return guest of the program. So I'm very excited to dig in. Uh, before we get to that, I do wanna provide a bio which I cannot do justice. Anil is an experienced senior public official. He's worked with Statistics Canada for over 25 years leading significant programs and transformations. He was appointed chief statistician of Canada in September, 2016. He has also served in policy and regulatory roles in the Government of Canada, at Natural Resources Canada, as well as Health Canada. He has led substantial international initiatives, working with the United Nations and the OECD, and received numerous prestigious awards for leadership. He serves on a number of boards, very active in the community and supporting community events and social causes. He received a Bachelor of Science from the University of Alberta, subsequent studies in computer science, holds a graduate certificate in public sector management and governments from the University of Ottawa and the Government of Canada's Advanced Leadership Development Program. And that's just to kind of get us start, <laughs> started. So, Anil, a very warm welcome to the conversation today. Oh, uh, thank you, Craig. Such a pleasure as always to be with you. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, and uh, for everybody who's live, the, the special bonus, you have the chance to ask Anil. He's kindly agreed to take any questions that you wish, so please chime in. Um, and, and, and just to begin this conversation, uh, as, as Canada's chief statistician, you've had the opportunity just watching your travels on LinkedIn, taking a part in different international statistical conferences and such amazing conversations what do you find are the key data points that different countries and, and, and uh, your counterparts are, are paying attention to uh, at this time? Well, it is a, it is a really privileged perch, you know, uh, to be able to, to see uh, in an objective way, uh, you know, what's going on both in Canada and, and internationally. Um, interestingly enough, there are so many things that are, not that different. Um, so, you know, this kind of uh, you know, getting out of the post-pandemic situation, obviously there's an economic context um, that uh, I think most developed countries are, are facing. We're starting to see, you know, uh, we're starting to see that, that kind of growth, uh, uh, you know, go up. We're seeing inflation. Now we're seeing public policy responses in most of these countries trying to figure out, you know, how do we get back to, uh, a position uh, where affordability and, 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 and everybody can kind of participate in the economy is, is really important. The other trend that I think most countries are seeing uh, is climate change and um, the impacts of that on you know, people's health. And, and I mean, you could just see what's going on in Canada, right? Um, 
And uh, so, um, you know, what's what's the impact on our uh, on on economies? Of course, every country has its own, uh, you know, kind of sources for generating wealth. And so, for countries like Canada, uh, which have a, a a real investment in natural resources and some of the more carbon intensive industries, of course, it's a it's a bigger uh, challenge. Um, and then you see this, you know, uh, competition as well. Um, so those are those are you know environmental slash economic and uh, social concerns. You see misinformation and disinformation. You see you know trust in institutions, um, and you see even you know social um, cohesion uh, and inclusion as being the big themes that I think most countries are are, are grappling with. And as you can see, most of those are still very relevant in Canada as well. Um, so I think. You know, it's it's degrees of intensity and 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 our respective economies and and some of our social changes. Of course, Canada is a is a country that is so dependent upon immigration, right? And so our diversity uh, presents both real opportunities as a country, but also some real challenges. I mean, 96 percent of our growth comes from immigration. Um, so, and that immigration is primarily, you know, from um, uh, you know racialized uh, uh, population. So. You know, we're trying to contend with a demographic of aging. We're trying to, you know, contend with skills. We're trying to, you know, on the one hand, sort of uh, use demog demography uh, and, and immigration as, as a strength. And on the other hand, we're trying to contend with some of the issues like housing and skills mismatch and so on and, you know, rural urban divide. So, so those are unique issues in Canada. Uh, uh, but as you can see, that, that, that statistical perch kind of, you know, shows there's some real commonalities, but there's some stark differences as well as a nation. Well, and it's so interesting, yes, and and thank you, uh, and and got some positive comments already on that uh, that that point. And what I really appreciate, it's interesting in in my own world, in 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 the perch that 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 I have, also those common challenges, if you will. Like again, it's very interesting that there are certain things that trans transcend no matter what sector you're in, what industry you're in, no matter where you are. Yes, there are some pieces that are unique to your your space or more relevant as you talked about i love how you frame that and then at the same time there's kind of this some human challenges if you will like things we're all going through so I, that's that that's really uh, cool to hear already have got questions and i'm not surprised and i love these questions already you touched on a little bit kevin's gonna gonna go a little further and say in love that you talked about misinformation like any thoughts around how uh, Statistics Canada or other agencies are trying to ensure that the highest quality data get in front of people. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to believe just a few years ago uh, uh, when, you know, this whole notion of alternative facts and, you know, I thought, really? Like, that's not gonna go anywhere, um, but here we are. So, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is real. And so you see, uh, technology uh, uh, playing a huge part in, in essentially taking, you know, data that are well researched and come from reputable organizations and the alternative, and and essentially in many cases giving it the same weight, um, and you know then exacerbated by the fact that there are uh, filter bubbles and there are communities that have emerged uh, where people vigorously defend their right to flat Earth or you know, or whatever have you, um, and and then all of a sudden more and more misinformation sort of gets fed, and before you know it, you know, I always say the plural of anecdote is not statistic, but 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 you know, many times people will uh, repeat the same uh, misinformation, and before you know it, it becomes um, uh, you know gospel. I mean, and our brains are wired to look at the sensational a lot more, you know, um, and and propagate it than than you know sometimes boring facts, if you know what I mean. So. So here we are, right? Uh, so you see, you know, people kind of really protecting their rights in in some sense to, you know, what we know for a fact is is not well grounded, um, and and so I think, you know, the, and that's that then yields um, distrust in 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 people and distrust in institutions and the media and politicians and so on. So it is a reality, uh, uh, and and so. The role of, I mean, we just we just hosted um, with the Institute of uh, International Statistical Institute, the 64th World Congress in Ottawa, 
Uh, it's the first time uh, in 60 years that uh, you know it came. This con this Congress uh, came back to Ottawa. Uh, some you know 1,800 people. Uh, now we're talking mathematicians, statisticians, data scientists. You know came to Ottawa to discuss. Uh, you know over 500 different um, sessions of different and misinformation, disinformation was very prominent. Um, so I know this is a, a, a this is a real issue for those that produce high quality, timely, granular, integrated, you know, stats and insights, um, it's a real challenge. How do you get, you know, things that are well researched, that have that kind of quality baked into it to get that, that, that uh, weight, if you like, in people's decision making. So it's not, a, it's not an easy challenge, um, uh, but certainly I think, you know, a uh, number of organizations are seized uh, with this particular issue. And so you know, what we're trying to do is get um, to where the data are being consumed. So in all its different forms, we're working with stakeholders uh, to make sure that it's easy for them to consume good quality information, that they understand the context, and that people are just as you know, interested in looking at the qualifiers of the data and you know, what's excluded and what's not included. Um, and so that they can actually walk away with what they think they're getting, not what they, you know, might be perceiving as right, but in fact, completely wrong. And lastly, we're also trying to help build some of the literacy and numeracy skills that are really important for people to do some critical thinking around these things. So we're doing our part. I don't think we're going to be exclusively the solution providers on this, uh, but I think there's a, there's a real desire and investment in trying to make sure that as a society, uh, that we're guided by good facts and good information. No, absolutely. And one of the things, and, and I love, and I'll be fully trained, I love statistics, I love data, I just think it's so powerful. And yet at the same time, it can be powerful for a source of good and, and challenge uh, and not so good. And I love the point around, and I really, I, I want to reiterate that and emphasize that a, a beautiful question you just articulated is, how can we be become better educated consumers of data? That's a really critical question, and and uh, and Emma, also, are there are there ways in which that we can do that? You've started to talk about that. What yeah. are some other things or points of consideration for us? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating it uh, too much by saying that, you know, good data uh, um, skills are now. A basic skill set that that you know is really required, and I know a lot of schools and institutions, educational institutions, are are starting to put more emphasis uh, on um, you know data management skills and you know how do you actually uh, look at a table or a chart, uh, you know, um, and and make sure that um, you can gleam out of it what what it's intended and what's not intended. So I'm glad to see that the schools, universities. Um, even um, businesses and organizations that rely, as you know, on on huge amounts of data. I, I don't know a single CEO that doesn't, you know, <laughs> first thing in the morning, you know, look at look at uh, uh, you know uh, what are some of the key the basic trends. I mean, GDP comes out, the the the, the CPI comes out, the uh, consumer price index, the you know trade numbers come out, and you know, or what the markets are doing or what the dollar is doing. Um, so I think we're very used to looking at those uh, data points and 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 I think we just need to make sure that those skill sets are, are are propagated for us you know it's as I said we need to sometimes be a little less technical because you know we can't come across as a bit too scary and so we're trying to do things like infographics and we're trying to you know put out webinars and we're trying to put out podcasts we have an app you know that people can easily um, uh, uh, you know, upload and 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 use it. And you can put alerts, and so we're we're trying to increase the readability and the consumption. We're trying to be more available through, you know, um, webinars and ask me anything sessions and you know emails and so on, so people can see that we're you know we're reachable, that we're here as a service. Um, and uh, I think we're partnering with so many organizations, from chambers of commerce to Federation of Canadian Municipalities to you know, um, NGOs to, to you name it with our other federal government colleagues so that um, they can see that this is a team sport and we're here to help. 
Um, so we're also playing a, um, a really important role in setting standards and playing that data stewardship role. So I, I think, and, and, and you know, credit where it's due, I think, you know, some of the seminars, some of the podcasts that we put out, you know, have also been top leading. Um, and, and I think the feedback that we've got is, yes, they're making a difference. And so the feedback that we get from our uh, stakeholders and users is going this direction, which is great to see. So um, more to be done. Obviously, um, uh, you know, clearly um, uh, there are many, many consumers out there who are very busy. It's not that they, they, they don't want to, but sometimes they would just take whatever Google might, you know, uh, give them as the first choice and say, well, it's got to be true as long as I cite it, it must be real. So, I, you know, our, our advice is, uh, you know, be a little bit more discerning, uh, you know, do a little bit of research and understand the limitations and strengths of what you're looking at, especially if you're going to make, you know, really, really important decisions that affect others or, you know, our economy or society, uh, you know, that, that kind of due diligence is really important. Well, and I love that. And I think uh, to your point, it's people are so busy and a lot of times, uh, you know, that, that headline, click the head, read the headline and come to a conclusion without engaging in the critical thought. And I think to your point that I couldn't agree more that's such a vital skill, especially now in a world with information overload, being able to discern the high, you know, as you said, the good data and separating it from the more questionable or just really misleading data so we can make the most informed choices in our personal and professional lives. And this pivots beautifully into my question around leadership because there's just so much emphasis today on, on leadership. So when you reflect on leadership and the qualities uh, for effective leadership, what do you think are front and center and what we, for both current leaders and aspiring leaders um, to, to, to really build? Well, you know, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, um, you know, I, I start off by saying that, you know, leadership is, is the same, uh, except that everything around it has changed. So, you know, uh, you know, the, as a, you know, you know, the old, um, there's a, there's a little cartoon, you know, where, to uh, you know, young fish sort of swim by, and an older one swims in, in the other direction, and the older one says to the other two, uh, "How's the water?" And they look at him funny, and as you know, they kind of pass each other. The the, the one young fish says to the other, "What's water?" You know, so uh, you know, so you know, the the point is that you know, leadership has to it works in a context, and you know, the same thing that applies. Uh, in, a, in a moment of crisis, uh, uh, slow or fast, because um, there are slow moving crises as we've just discussed earlier, um, you know, that, that leadership has to take that into account. I mean, if, you know, a whole population has just gone through a very stressful situation, you know, there's, there's, there's been tragedies, there's been, you know, uh, upheaval in lives and, and, and well-being and so on. But if as a leader, we don't understand that and, and you know, we just keep going with Sort of, you know, what 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 we've done previously, uh, you can almost see the disaster kind of coming, right? So, so I think today's leader is not the same leader as 10 years ago, or five years ago, or 20 years ago. Uh, that leader today, she has to be far more aware of, um, you know, what are the data showing? Like, what's the fact? What's the reality? Um, has to be able to show that context and how it's evolving within the organization and that organization you know, within today's economy or society, you know, with some of the, the challenges that we talked about uh, uh, up early on. Your business and how it operates in an international context is gonna be very different in terms of leadership style than, you know, something that's local and, and, and relying on a neighborhood clientele, for example. So, so I think understanding the context, understanding your people, knowing, having good facts and data that tell you uh, what's going on, I think is 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 the first thing. The second thing, uh, so in other words, you know, in the old, it's like wisdom, and you know, I did this, and that'll work. Well, you know what? I, I, uh, there's some really really smart, sharp people uh, who are more than happy to tell you, yeah, but here's the data. Um, and so, you know, so one needs to have a little bit of humility and defer to evidence rather than gut feeling uh, and so on. And you and, and you have to kind of be ready to be challenged and, and be ready to be proven wrong. And, and it's okay. And a good leader today has, uh, should have no problems in saying, you know what, I didn't get that right. Uh, what do I learn from it? And how do I, you know, engage and work? 
leadership, of course, is all about people, right? Um, so, you, you know, it's kind of a prerequisite, I suppose. Um, you know, so uh, leading people um, is, you know, one that uh, requires today a far greater amount of empathy um, and understanding of, of people's motivations and their fears. I mean, you know, uh, like I said, if society's gone through uh, a huge stressful experience, we see the data tell us about mental health and so on. But if we as leaders don't think that the people that work with us, our colleagues, aren't part of society and that they're somehow, you know, as soon as they walk in through the door at eight o'clock in the morning or, or whatever, that, that there's something else. Well, the, that's a, again, a, a real, a, a real a problem and a mistake. So I think understanding that, you know, our colleagues, ourselves, um, we are part of that society and going through that same change um, and where things now intersect, whereas previously people could, uh, you know, make that distinction. Um, just needs us to be a, a, a bit more sophisticated uh, and look at the complexity of what leadership looks like today. And yet, even with that complexity, how do we simplify things and go to the basics, you know, values and trust. And, you know, so those things, those things don't change And that empathy and listening. I think those are the skill sets of a leader. So uh, I think leadership is, is inherently more difficult today. It's not for everybody. Um, and, 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 and frankly, uh, I think um, a, a healthy dose of humility, but equally that ability to have a compelling vision, to influence and in, inspire people, uh, be that listener, uh, and, and, and still making sure that we can simplify things um, and, and move forward. Uh, and simplify in the sense of being really crisp about where is it that you know, the organization wants and needs to go, um, and then aligning it with you know, the employees and their desires, when those two things intersect and you've got a healthy Venn diagram, it's a golden golden opportunity for, for organizations. Well, and I received so many awesome answers. Love this. Uh, great insights. Thank you, Anil, uh, coming in. So I want to pass that along. And I so many great points uh, that you made. I love your observation about leadership happens in a context. It works in a context. And, I, and I'm with you very much as well in terms of just what has happened over the past several years is that it's amplified things that were pre-COVID. There are all these things coming to bear that now when COVID happened, it just mental health and all kinds of other aspects that just continue to come to the surface. And fundamentally, uh, the human side of leadership, it just is getting increasingly important, yet it's always been there. It's always an essential part of it. And I love your emphasis on understanding of context and people, and in particular on the empathy piece, um, understanding someone else's space, what's important to them, what they value, sharing what I value, and then also having the humility to just say, I, I, I didn't get this, I was off on that. And once again, love the point on data and referencing data. I mean, some of the most compelling uh, conversations I've been a part of is that so how do we use this moment in time to experiment gather data and make informed decisions rather than go well I think this or I think why let's use data to inform uh, you know, uh, organizations are sitting on 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 a wealth of data um, we're I think a lot of organizations are quite happy to use that data to you know increase their market share to uh, 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 you know to to make the right decisions on when to invest in capital or more labor or whatever it is. But we tend to somehow downplay the data that we have that allows us to be better leaders with our, uh, you know, within our organizations. Now, you know, that does not say that, you know, we don't, uh, we shouldn't be taking privacy and confidentiality and, you know, residual disclosure issues or, or how, but there is tremendous wealth uh, in the data itself about ourselves. And in fact, I always, you know, I, I find that when we can harness that in responsible ways, it will actually help propel the business or our, our objectives as, you know, whether public uh, organizations or private forward. And I think it's it's under uh, utilized. And so in my organization, you know, I try to use our corporate um, uh, uh, leaders, not just as service, internal service providers or, you know, uh, gatekeepers or whatever, but they're truly enablers that align us to move us as a unit forward uh, in achieving our vision. So, so there is a lot of information there. So having 
the data management skills, uh, as I said, with you know the privacy protection techniques and so on built in, uh, is a is a is has been a phenomenal investment uh, uh, for us, anyways. Mm. Well, and again, I just love that uh, approach in terms of looking at, so what are the data sharing and showing us about our leadership and how we're showing up? And then we can make informed choices around that and recognizing the impacts. And then also having the humility to look at those data as well. And so uh, my next question, uh, you know, and Anil, this is your life. I'd love for you to describe, so who are you as a leader? Like what's what's that? What's your leadership philosophy? Why are a part of your team? What do you, how, how, what, who's authentic, Anil? Well, if you got it in my head, you'd find it very messy. Uh, that's, that's the first <laughs> one. Um, yeah, look, you know, uh, first of all, um, uh, uh, you know, leadership shifts and changes, as I mentioned. Um, you know, we all learn over time. You know, what I thought in my 20s and 30s as leadership um, isn't the same that I see today. And uh, so the context is different, technology is different, the data availability is different, the workforce is, is, is different. So um, me as an authentic leader is one um, that is not afraid to change my mind and, 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 and open to saying, you know what, that worked there, but it won't work here. Um, it's uh, being vulnerable and, and open to feedback. You know? So I believe in you know, asking my team on a regular basis, like, what can I do differently? Like, how, yeah, you know what? I don't think that conversation went very well. I don't think I was very clear about what it is that, you know, I meant to say, I don't think I listened to you well enough, you know? So, so I, and the, and the authentic Anil is always kind of learning, 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 um, and, and not afraid to, 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 you know, to admit, you know, my failures. And, and I tell them like, I, you, you need to help me as a leader so that I can help the organization and, 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 and everybody else. So, so that's, uh, that's the authentic, uh, you know, so I'm not afraid to show frailty. I'm not afraid to show weaknesses. I'm not afraid to show, because I feel when I do that, uh, I'm, I'm showing that I am connecting at a human level with my, with my colleagues and, um, and, th and that, you know what, we're in this thing together. I may have a, a different role, uh, but you know what, my, the objectives are not that different and the trust that we have within each other is shared. Um, and that, you know what, I do make mistakes as well, but boy, I'm the first one to admit it and learn from it. So that's the, you know, I don't know what else, like, you know, what else, who else could one be? Cause if, you know, I tried to be fake, I think they probably figured it out in about 30 seconds that, well, wait a second, that's just a put on. Uh, Cause you can't sustain, you know, something that is not authentic for too long. Um, you know, uh, now having said that, in moments of crisis, you will see a very different Anil. Like it's clear, it's where we need to go. This is who's going to do what. This is the reporting structure. Here are the, you know, the 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 success criteria and the KPI or the key performance indicators that we're going to manage and and measure to go ahead. So, so there is that leadership style when it needs it. Okay, but that's that's not every single day. And you'd hope that you you know you're not wow. Well, I suppose somebody could be in those kinds of jobs, but but that's generally not the sort of the default style. I think the default style is a bit more on that partnership, collaborate, collaboration, um, and, and all those attributes that I just talked about. So the context also, uh, and, and the last thing I would say is that, you know, there are some, you know, individuals with whom you, you, just, you just have to be really straight up front and say, that's just not gonna work here. And you're gonna have to make a tough choice. And so, you know, so, Leadership and authenticity also, you know, uh, uh, take courage because I think equally people see the vulnerability, but, but they also see inconsistency. And so leadership is also what you tolerate and, and people see what you tolerate and they call you out on it. So, um, you know, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, authenticity, um, uh, you know, with generous amounts of, of, of listening and learning and humility, I think that's that's kind of who we are as, as, as leaders. And I love the point about the, the inconsistency. I think that's such a, and, and linking it back to the authenticity as well, that you hear it more and more in conversation about the importance of being authentic. And as soon as there's inconsistency now, right away, and you talked about trust, and I, again, awesome that you made that link reference earlier, because as soon as those inconsistencies start, and now it's like, uh oh, what's going on here? Who is this person? How does this all connect? And I also, because 
And this is critical, and I really appreciate you, Shauna Light on Courage. Because th having difficult conversations, that's a it's a part of life. It's even more of a part of leadership, right? That's the mantle of responsibility. And it's important for us to be able to show up very, very uh, authentically in those conversations and not shy away. We must have that courage, especially uh, in, in, in our environment. Yeah. So got another uh, question, and, uh, and this is from, from Tom, who said, really love the idea of asking for feedback. Often I'm afraid of like, what if I don't like the answer or I disagree, like any advice uh, on, yeah. on that front? Yeah, look, what's the alternative, right? I mean, if you don't uh, uh, um, uh, ask, um, you know, I think most people say, well, he doesn't care. Um, he doesn't care what I think or, or whatever. Now, doesn't mean that you have to <clears throat> agree with everything. It is a perspective. And now it's another data point that you have uh, to be able to then put into your repertoire to say, okay, well, you know what, maybe I can do a little better in terms of being clearer with my message or, you know, the resonating with people. So maybe that strategy didn't work. So even though that is exactly what I'm saying, um, people aren't getting it. Or I'm saying this, but this is what people are listening. And so, so I think denying yourself that data point, I think just doesn't really help you be a, a more effective leader. So you're better off to ask and get feedback that you might just not agree with. That's okay, you at least have a choice to make at that point. But not knowing, I think is, 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 is uh, I think more fatal uh, than, than, and then receiving something that you may not agree with, right? Well, I, I love, again, what's great, and thank you, got the bunch of thank yous on that, uh, on, on that answer. And, and it is about choice because now we have data, <laughs> again, you, feedback is data that now we can choose to either ignore or act on. And now we're empowering ourselves around it. And I think the framing that you just used, Anil, on that is, hey, like, let's ask, it's out there. So it's better for us to know whatever that is and tackle it and be aware, put that into our awareness. You know, the more complicated our organizations are, um, the more um, uh, uh, you know diverse they are, the more spread out they are, uh, the more hierarchical they may be. There just happens to be these permafrost zones that kind of you know appear in, in in organizations. And I think it's better to you know find out and then deal with it because if you know I would say yeah you know, uh, I'm sitting in my office and and and, and pulling levers all day. I would hate to think at the end of the day that they weren't connected to anything, you know? So, so in other words, as leaders, we're generally working through governance systems, we're working through uh, layers and so on. It's important and it's critical to build feedback mechanisms so that you can see whether, you know, the intention and the result are connected or the message and the noise and the signal are not connect or, you know, whether the culture is supportive or not. So I think that feedback loop is, is really, really critical. Now, it has to be authentic. We have to be willing to listen to what people are saying and not dismiss it. Um, and, and as I said, a healthy dose of humility where you suspend judgment and there's that appreciative inquiry on, on what, we're, what we're hearing and then having that open discussion say, well, how do you mean? You know, what, why do you think the way, you know, what could I do better uh, to get the message out? I think. I think those are all areas that I think we can, you know, I can certainly do uh, better in, and I'm always trying to do uh, a, a better job. Well, and 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 thank you, and 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 really appreciate that uh, pre that reference to appreciative inquiry, asking questions. You know, what's right about this feedback, uh, as opposed to looking to dismiss it outright. Can you give me some examples, like how else could I approach? All based in curiosity, and I think it just deepens the relationship and again coming back to a core element you touched on before trust because it demonstrates a genuine curiosity on our side and we can explore that together uh i've got another question questions are fire coming on in and i'm not surprised so Anne wants to to explore a little deeper on the inconsistency so any advice in terms of how do you address inconsistencies in someone when you see it when they're clearly offside and they're 
uh, flipping back and forth. Any advice around how you raise that, how you address that? So if I understand the question right, this is um, somebody uh, who's saying one thing but acting another way uh, or, or um, and, and you know, that, look, like, people translate things in, in certain way. Like, you know, we can have the same word but have a very different kind of perspective just because of our lived experience, right? I mean, you know, the examples of looking at the, you know, the mountain and the lake and, you know, just having a very different kind of uh, experience from it. So that happens. So I think th we just have to, um, like, first of all, just acknowledge that, right? That that we don't, you know, there's a lot of uh, connotations around language and connotations around things. So I think, you know, going to like something a bit more objective, like the data, the results, the, you know, something that's tangible to kind of break the ties in the sense between what may appear as inconsistent, but frankly, it's an interpretation that, that might not align with the vocabulary that we use. So first is not jumping to the conclusion, ah, this person's just kind of, you know, um, you know, just wants to appear or whatever. And, and, and so that's the first thing. But if you do see somebody who, who's just kind of, uh, you know, saying one thing but but doing another thing, it's entirely okay to have a chat with them and say like, I don't understand how, you know, if we have these values and if we have these objectives and if we have this vision, how this action is supporting that. Um, because, you know, I don't understand, help me understand. Um, and, and listen, I mean, you know, they may just have a different strategy uh, to achieve, you know, the same objective, but just may appear to be inconsistent or they may have adapted it to their particular context that we may not, at you know, whatever level we might be at, um, be aware of, of that level. Because organizations have production units, strategic units, you know, policy setting, regulatory, you know, uh, whatever it might be. And so sometimes those messages have to be adapted in a way that works in that context. And that's okay, as long as you know that it's ultimately aligned to the, you know, to the objective of, of, of the vision. So I'm, I don't want to come across as, uh, you know, I'm just going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Like sometimes if they truly are misaligned, you know, you, you may have to sit down and say, look, I, I understand, but that's going the wrong way. Like, you know, we're not going to give everybody an extra 10 days of vacation. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? So sometimes you have to call on it and say, that's not on. Right. And, and so, yeah. So sometimes that courage and being clear, and being, you know, very, very directive about, you know, the direction that you want is is okay to 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 get rid of that inconsistency that you might have in the organization. Mm. Well, and and again, I, I really appreciate the reference to the labels because uh, I'm I see it all so so often in the coaching work that I do where people are using the same behavior, different labels, and so now even though it sounds like and it's wild all of the assumptions that can be built into that and i really appreciate your perspective on this anil about well ask a question be curious rather than jump to a conclusion oh well you are x help me understand craig i heard you say this and then i observed that can you can you thread that needle for me and it's curiosity and you're not judging anyone around it and Perhaps in their mind, again, they see the situation a little differently, or they may be inconsistent. And now that's an important point for us to uh, for us to to discuss. So I I really appreciate that point again from curiosity. Yeah, you know, like it's you know, I've had the the fortune of going into new organizations and setting a new vision, and you know, kind of taking it in a different direction. And yes, there are some people uh, who are you know, very adverse to change and, and, and want to simply relabel things so that they align with, you know, the direction that you want. And, and so one has to be a little bit critical, you know, in, in, in that. And so, you know, you, you want to have that openness in it. But also, I would say, in addition to everything that we've just talked about, build some objective metrics that tell you, um, you know, whether the action and the, and the direction and the, the you know, what, what, what you want is change behavior and outcomes um, are in fact happening. So if it's a line of business that you don't want to be in and people are just kind of saying, well, there can be objective measures, you know, uh, uh, on revenue or otherwise that, that can tell you very clearly that that shift didn't, didn't occur. Or 
you know, the reverse. You want it in a particular direction, and and if and if the, you're not seeing the sales, or you're not seeing that market penetration, or you're not seeing you know usage of data or a policy or a regulatory con conformant, well then the data will start to tell you. And I think making that available to the person that's talking gets them to go, mm, yeah, I guess I guess it's it's not really you know. So so I think I think making it self-evident is is I think really really important. Um, and, and 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 you know hopefully turning somebody around as really a proponent rather than an, a, an opponent. Well, thank you. No, great great insights. And I have another question, uh, and it's one that uh, that I was uh, in my list as well. So um, uh, Tara was wondering about return to office, and so this as we've turned the corner around the pandemic, uh, or we continue to turn that corner again. Back to labeling. Uh, how can organizations you know do this effectively have those operate with courage and empathy using two of your words from before so what are your thoughts on that well uh, look i it's been far more difficult than 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 i thought it would be frankly uh you know uh, i just kind of speak about my own um uh, uh kind of direction and, and vision and experience so long before the pandemic um you know for my organization i had this kind of um, vision of a, of, a, of a hybrid type of uh, an approach. Now, we didn't call it hybrid at the time, but it was, you know, the, the intent was that from time to time, you can work from, from an alternate location uh, and that, you know, the data can actually flow with people uh, in a secure way. And, and so that mobility, if you like, of the, uh, the data and the expertise could create greater value. Uh, so it would create greater mobility of people to move and broaden their skill sets. We could actually start to, you know, bring different data sets together to create new uh, insights, um, and those flexibilities would be there. And frankly, in a country like Canada, when you have snowstorms, we, we we actually triangulated data. Like, you know, um, when we have 10 centimeters of of snow, um, you know, what does the sick leave look like? When we have 20 centimeters of snow, what does the sick leave look like? It, it comes back to that point about you know, all the data that we don't necessarily always triangulate and use. And what we found was there was a significant increase in leave, especially amongst women, um, when the number of centimeters of snow uh, uh, was, was, was high. So um, we said, well, clearly, in some cases, it's the mom who's staying home with the kids because the school buses aren't running, and so they have to take leave. And so we thought, okay, well, look, there's a business case here for you know, the technologies to be able to allow people to securely work, you know, from, from alternate locations. And so we were already having that kind of success before the pandemic. And the idea was the pandemic obviously didn't give us a choice and said, boom, you know what, we have no choice. We're all going to work virtually for periods of time. Um, although many people in very, very, uh, you know, important services came to the office and worked in secure ways throughout the whole pandemic. So I don't want to in any way negate that or take it away from the, the work that happened, and many organizations had that, right? So critical services where people did that. Now the question is, how do you, like, what is that new norm? How do you establish it? Because, you know, people did that and did a great job, I would say. And so many of them look at this as punitive in a sense, right? Why are you making me, you know, buy new clothes, buy parking, you know, lunches, this, that, and the other, you know? And they got used to, like, home care, elder care, daycare. Um, and so it's it's hard <clears throat> it's hard for them to you know to say but as an organization we know that there is a cost you know when people aren't coming together to innovate and share ideas mentor new people well then you know we're not seeing that that same kind of productivity and that same culture and that spirit of kind of you know making things uh, incrementally better and so finding that right norm, depending upon the business that you're in, depending upon the culture, depending upon the demographics and uh, of, of you, who you have, just requires a little bit more uh, uh, thought and, 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 you know, not everybody likes it, not everybody likes everything, but, you know, to your team, you have to at least be, be, be consistent and, and, and figure out what makes sense uh, and, and, and to, you know, new people who are coming in you have to figure out how, what kind of mentoring and coaching you can give them, you know, what kind of innovation. So it's got to be driven with purpose. It's got to have a little bit of flexibility. And, 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 and I think at the end of the day, you can't kind of sacrifice the norms and values of an organization as you move to a, to a hybrid kind of future. So it's not easy. It is happening. 
Um, and, and I think a lot of our data are showing that people who are consistently coming in are now happier um, uh, than, than those that, uh, that, that very infrequently or don't come in at all to meet their colleagues. And it can't just be, we got together for lunch. I don't think that's quite working. I think they actually have to, you know, roll up their sleeves and actually work to make things better, uh, you know, create new products and, and innovative types of solutions. That's what gives people, uh, that's what's giving people more satisfaction with what, uh, what the work looks like. That's well, cool. and, and thank you. And, and again, comments coming in around really appreciate that the focus on purpose, flexibility and, and values uh, anchors, if you will, in terms of okay. And, and really appreciate the point because uh, part of conversations that, that, that I've been in around Okay, it's before pre-pandemic, for the most part, there was almost like this level playing field. Now everyone's like, okay, so what's gonna, what does this look like for us, right? And and being thoughtful around it. And I really think starting with why, that purpose statement, recognizing the flexibility to take into account, all right, what's happening in our context, and then and anchoring in in values. And really appreciate the point around, uh, it's fascinating here, the data, that you have, Anil, around people being happier who come in more uh, because had Dr. Robert Waldinger come in and it was one of the recent episodes I released and that was one of his, without weighing in, it was like, it's all about relationships. Like the relationships we have drive happiness, meaning, uh, satisfaction with life. And so that was a question about, so what's going to be the consequence if we don't have time for interaction above and beyond, as you said, lunch and everything else, like that meaningful connection. So uh, love love that point. Uh, have another uh, uh, question that's uh, that's come in as well um, from from Timothy, and he was wondering. Like it seems like people are really burnt out, or you read a lot about just people feeling stretched, overburdened, like a lot bad news, you know, coming at us, like. What are your thoughts around keeping people motivated when there's been such a prolonged period of challenge? Yeah, look, it is a, uh, you know, whatever the $64 million question or, or whatever it is, it's, uh, you know, it, it, anybody finds the elixir of that, please share it. Um, so, you know, no, as I was saying right at the beginning of the session, right? I mean, you know, we, we, we live in a context, we, we've just come through you know, hopefully um, come through and two, hopefully once in a, you know, uh, whatever, 50, 60 years, kind of a, a crisis of that nature, it has been anything but ordinary and it has been everything, um, uh, 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 you know, that, uh, that a, a, a disruption would look like. And it's been, you know, I think, what is it, the poly crisis is one of the terms that's being used. Uh, so it's like one crisis after the other, after the other. So, you know, there was a the health, which then, you know, got into an economic and, you know, affordability. And, um, and of course, it doesn't affect everybody the same way. Um, you know, if you're, uh, our data show that if, if you're, if you're youth, you're, you're hurting a, a lot more. If you're part of a, a, a racialized group, you're hurting a lot more. If you're, you know, a person with a disability, you're really hurting. An indigenous person is, you know, so, so the impacts are not the same on everybody. Uh, some have actually done better. I mean, we also talked about triple protected jobs, you know, people who were, you know, in jobs that could be done um, remotely that had good uh, job security and tenure and actually because they weren't spending as much actually made off well, better financially as well. So, so you can't kind of, you know, uh, paint it with the same brush. Um, and yet there are people that organizations, including mine, relied on a heck of a lot more because, well, guess what? They were in that pivotal role. They had the knowledge. They had the skill sets, and we needed it. And in our, you know, in our in our desire to serve Canadians during that period, we just over, you know, uh, relied on them. And and in some cases, you know, that workload uh, distribution was not equal, um, and it was uh, 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 disproportionate. And so, as leaders, we have to recognize that. You know, we're we're not robots. Um, we are humans. We do need that recharge. And then we need to find innovative ways uh, to make sure. Now, I also am a, a bit careful and cautious that if that narrative gets out there that everybody, you know, is overworked and stressed and whatever, I mean, even people who aren't go, there must be something wrong with me if I'm not, you know. So I think we need to be 
<coughs> excuse me, careful uh, about that. So you need you need a, 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 a really honest, open conversation. Um, and and you know, organizations usually have a, a norm, a bar, a set kind of you know a set of expectations. Um, and so you know, there has to be some objective measures which show you know, yes, we truly did. And this one, well, no, hang on, that's a bit of a myth. And we need to, you know, we need to kind of address it. Um, so, so it's a bit more complicated. And that's why I said it's a $64 million question, because it's not one formula that's, that's going to work. And if you, if one gets it wrong, one could actually have the opposite effect that then that is desired. So you have to rely on some objective metrics. And then you have to apply some of the metrics or the success indicators and then be able to track them over time to see whether the you know the kind of uh, um, initiatives that are putting in that are being put in place or you put in place are having the desired results. So you want the performance of those that maybe wasn't that stellar or great. You want to invest in you know their skill set so that it can come up to the level that you want. And for those that maybe were overburdened, and you know how do you bring you know how do you provide opportunities for them to have that kind of balance, which it which makes sense. So you might be pulling and pushing in an organization at the same time. It might be hierarchical. It might be in, you know, for certain sets of groups and so on. This is where empathy, uh, you know, generous amounts of listening, being able to discern, you know, what is fact or not with good evidence, and then building in metrics that demonstrate that you're having the desired result that you want in the, in the direction that you want, obviously aligned to the business of the organization. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 that focus on open and honest conversations, and and it harkens me back to the beginning again. It's amazing how some threads continue along with you, right? Where you talked about context and recognizing. So rather than having a blanket statement of okay, well, there are what's the context, what's operating here, and what are some of the important, and what are some of the potential consequences or unintended consequences that we're through a particular an adoption of a particular. Uh, perspective and also really appreciated the you know that emphasis on listening and empathy and then also about us not being robots which perfectly sets me up for my last we're almost out of time and i am uh, this is something that i was curious about your take on because ai is everywhere and chat gbt and so it's just it's difficult to go anywhere these days without it uh, and I had a few questions in the in the hopper here, and that was going to be one of mine. So, in terms of um, where you are, Anil, what are your thoughts around artificial intelligence? How it's going to impact us as a society, as as employers, as as Canadians, as citizens of the world? Love to get your your take on that. Yeah, look, I mean, <clears throat> somewhere between the hype uh, and and the and the genuine. Um, uh, applicability, I think, is the truth, and and so you know, there's some harmless kinds of utility of AI. Um, uh, 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 you know, who knows? Maybe you even went to ChatGPT and said, "What should I ask the you know chief statistician?" So, I mean, so, so you know, so you know what I mean. And I think a lot of people, including me, uh, will go to ChatGPT and just kind of you know ask some innocent questions and things like that. So, I think the ability for um, you know, large language models to be able to give us human consumption, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, language and, and data and facts and so on, uh, I think is, is, is a wonderful kind of way forward. I think it's when we start to apply it in ways that now start to impact decisions, safety, you know, policy decisions, regulatory kind of work, uh, or business kind of, that's when it becomes very real. And I think that's where we need uh, 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 you know, the kind of checks and balances, you know, at all levels. Uh, we need it at a moral and ethical level. We need it at the, you know, regulatory and legal level. And we need it, you know, uh, at, the, at the consumption level. Um, and as you know, I mean, these models are, are, are based on data, right? That, that's what they do. They take data and, and, and they, you know, kind of comb, you know, whatever uh, uh, stores are accessible and then, you know, try and put it in a language that, you know, resonates with us as, as human beings. So some of it is very well researched and, and is actually quite, um, you know, amazing. And some of it is just, as they say, hallucination. So they're not, you know, it's, it, it, it is the engine kind of, you know, doubling down on something that it thinks is, 
it's it's a, you know it's right or what we want to hear, but it's really not based on any any facts. And then there's a malicious kind of you know you've seen the images of you know famous people uh, with voices and doing things and so on. So there's there's a malicious component to it as well. I would say you know a lot of disruptive technologies start that way, right? And and then I think they settle down. You, we build we build in the kind of guidance. We build in the governance. We build in the frameworks for ethical and moral applications of them. And then we you know, it doesn't mean that there won't be a rogue state or rogue use or rogue whatever, but, you know, I think I, I think we have to find that balance of, you know, uh, caution and utility. It's like the car, right? It, it has both accelerator and the brakes, and we need to use them in, in, in the right context and the right proportions. So I know um, there's a lot of work going on, you know, my own organization internationally as well. And I think we're staying on top of both, uh, the positives uh, as well as some of the negatives um, and, and I think like anything else uh, this will evolve. Uh, the pace of this is, is, is amazing when you look at how quickly it's taken on um, uh, and so I think it is uh, something to be a little bit cautious about and a little bit skeptical about uh, but I would say um, you know we can't, we can't be paralyzed by it like a deer in the headlights as well. I think we need to learn about it, we need to understand how to contend with it, we need to you know, cautiously and carefully ex experiment with it, but know that the underlying data are really, really important. Those biases, you know, incorrect data, wrong sources will only get exacerbated as these technologies take on. So that, that critical thinking that we talked about up front, you know, I think is going to be uh, just as important. So being numerate and literate, I think, is, uh, is, is, is a key to these things. Well, and uh, thank you, and such, again, phenomenal answer. Thank you, really insightful, lots to think about uh, coming in in the comment section. And for me, and this is why I was so excited for, for you to come back, and again, thank you. The hour's just flown by. I can't believe it's, you know, we're, we're three minutes away. Um, and, uh, and what I really love about how you started the answer to the question was moral and ethical implications. That is such, you know... I heard it described as, you know, being good parents, if you will, around AI. And I think that's such a powerful and such an important thing for all of us to reflect on. And also, as you talked about the data, right, that's going to be, we're all data points that also are, are part of that process. So uh, thank you. That's just uh, you've given me so much to think about. Uh, before we close, I'm going to throw it to you, Anil, for a, a final point, just for those of you live. And thank you again for taking the time. Uh, next week, uh, on Wednesday, uh, August 2nd at 3 p.m. Eastern, going to have Rob Cross, the author of The Micro Stress Effect. Um, it's going to be joining us for another live webinar and podcast episode. So if you can come uh, and join us then, I would love to see you there. But Anil, this has just been absolutely awesome. Feel so privileged uh, that you've taken the time out of your extraordinarily schedule to share your wisdom your experience your insight your passion with us any final words before we say goodbye today well all i have is gratitude for you and the work that you're doing to develop um you know uh, leaders like myself and so many more uh to you know push our country forward and so i just i just want to say thank you for all that you do um you know congratulations on the on the book and the and the podcast um, you know, uh, it should be the number one and stay at that number one spot for, for, for a long, long time. So, so Craig, thank you for your, um, invitation and your friendship. And, um, I, I, I really, really do admire, uh, what you're doing. And, and I just want to say thank you to everybody that posed the questions and, and, um, uh, and we're interested in, uh, in what's going on in Canada today. So thank you, Craig. Well, you're welcome. Uh, feeling is feelings are mutual, and uh, again, seeing the 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 fabulous questions. Why well, I love being a part of this, right? It's like uh, the uh, uh, a fly on the wall. This amazing conversation and touching on things that are so important to each of us, personally and professionally, and then talk about how we can be at our best so that we can be at, at be show up the way that we want for others. And I really do. It's something that, again, for me, it's on multiple layers. Just being how can we be better educated uh, data consumers? And there's data all around us and how can we best absorb and act on them? So thank you for all the amazing work that you do and your passion around ensuring that we have the best data 
possible for us to go through. So thank you, everybody. This was amazing. Can't wait to see you on a future episode. Bye for now. Thank you.